Hello and welcome to the first episode of On the Waters, our brand new podcast about religion and theology and world myth. I'm Jordan. And I'm Liv Nutt. And we've been wanting to talk to you guys for quite some time about things that really fascinate us. And as students of religion, the Genesis narrative is particularly fascinating to us. I think that it's pretty universally agreed that it's a kind of focal point for religious thought and general creation stories especially around the Mediterranean and for its time. But the story has also had a much wider impact on later culture, later thought, and continues to have an effect even on our modern pop culture. It's, it's almost inescapable, the influence of Genesis or uh, the Cheshit, as it's known in classical Hebrew. So we're going to be talking about what makes Genesis unique as a creation narrative and also the similarities that it has with other Babylonian, Mesopotamian, and broader Mediterranean creation stories of the time. So, Lidnot, what exactly are we going to be talking about today? Well, as uh, as you can probably tell from the name of our podcast, which means On the Water, uh, we refer to the first introduction uh, in Genesis where God is hovering on the water which is in the original line, Bereshit bara Elohim et ha-shamayim ve-et ha-aretz, v'ha-aretz aita tohu v'vohu, v'choshech al p'nei te-om, v'ruach Elohim merachefet al p'nei ha-mayim. And the verb merachefet, uh, uh, which means f- hover, it's just beautiful. It, it feels like very majestic, like um, some kind of big creator hands touching the idea or the substance in which he's going to create life from. It's very delicate, it's very mystical, it's almost uh, it's almost very intimate. The machachefet uh, and the intimacy of that image that Levna is talking about is something that was really intriguing to us, and it's something that we're going to discuss as being, we believe, in part inspired by similar creation stories that preceded Genesis. But let's take uh, a minute and... I do want to add, if it's possible, that the idea that like hovering on the water has additional meaning because we also consider the whole uh, walking on the water uh, by the New uh, Testament where Jesus is uh, walking on the water and it's kind of... And it's kind of passing on the torch. Like, it was very important for the New Testament to show uh, the symbolic and basically... Uh, the word Melchefet also means that we are going to look at something from a, a wider a wider perspective, a bigger bigger idea of what the image is. And that's basically our idea for a podcast, to actually to glance at something, to look at it, to have our comment, but at the same time not to dive too deeply into it, but still have enough uh, material for you all to tune in, to ask questions to comment and for us to maybe go over in the future podcast, hopefully will be made and coming after this one. Yes. And we'd like to make it clear that we are two very enthusiastic students of religion. Uh, We both study ancient languages to some extent, and we read the text in the original language. We want to get closer to the intent and, and original meaning behind these texts. But we are in no way affiliated with any university. We're not doing this in an official capacity. We're just like everybody else. We're interested students, and we'd like to share our thoughts and kind of rambling ruminations with you about these subjects. But yes, uh, on that point, with the significance of the water and why we chose the name for the podcast, it, it seems to us that water has a very central place in the symbolic language of the Abrahamic religions, whether it's the Jordan or the Red Sea or the Mediterranean itself, both in the Abrahamic religions and in these these broader sort of Mesopotamian and Mediterranean faith systems, water seems to have had a very important role. And most of these belief systems have a, a, a flood narrative at some point. And that is something that they all share in common. So we're going to explore that. But in any event, before we get to the Machachefeth, Uh, the image of God hovering over the water. Let's take a moment and backtrack and go to the first verse in Genesis, which, as Livnat just said, is, And, obviously, one of the more famous openings in literary history, not simply in, in religious history, commonly translated as, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
And so this is where we have the image from the very beginning, from the outset of God as a creator, not only as a creator, but as a sort of engineer, an architect. And this is something that is relatively unique to Judaism and to the Abrahamic religions that followed it, where we have a single creator, we have a monotheistic faith system, where all of the organizational principles of other gods from other faiths are centralized into this one figure. Yes. And another difference is while uh, in this particular text, uh, God is a creator, is a maker, is, is something different than his creation. In a lot of other um, stories that talk about the creation of the word God or God's are doing it in a very intimate, sexual, lustful, vengeful uh, way. Um, so in this way, we will soon go over it to show the differences, but it's very important to say. I, I do want to focus on the first word, uh, which means Bereshit. Bereshit could appear to a lot of people, you know, as a word to just say at first, at the beginning, but to those who are sensitive to the language, uh, those who are familiar with the Hebrew letters, We'll wonder, it's not by chance that they choose this word. Because this word actually starts with the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet and it ends with the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So it's kind of interesting. It, it kind of gives the idea that like there was something before, which is kind of curious. Like uh, what, what, what exactly happened before? Because where, where is the first letter? Why, why didn't they start the story with a first, the first alphabetic letter? So in this way, we kind of go deeper into the idea that this was not the first word God created, probably not the last. And this can be found echoed in the Quran, where Allah is known as the Lord, not only of this world, but of all worlds. So this idea of God as this magnificent creator, again, continues to evolve and, and be fine-tuned in, in later uh, text. And yes, um, to further this discussion of uh, the word Bacheshit, I want to make it a point uh, here that we're going to be referring to the Brown Driver Briggs Hebrew and English lexicon. It's sort of the standard text in biblical dictionaries. And according to it, as many of you may know, the word from which uh, Cheshit derives is Chosh. Uh, it's a, a kind of a common Semitic word meaning literally head. And by extension, it comes to mean First or beginning, uh, chief, choicest. So this word has somewhat of a different connotation in Hebrew than it would in, say, English. Where we may conceive of the beginning as being simply chronological, in Hebrew it has connotations of, of being important and more significant. And so looking at it from this perspective, it's no mystery as to why they chose the word Bacheshith to begin the first text in the Hebrew Bible. Mm -hmm. Well, the, they say that, you know, the, the head is the first, the star. So it's uh, very, very interesting. And then we, we are coming for the second uh, word, which means bara. And a lot of scholars already uh, show that the bara has a very interesting uh, meaning. Unlike uh, the verb create, bara actually refer to create something out of nothing. Uh, we refer to the first creation of God being God and creating even something without needing to have additional substance, which is very different from a lot of other creation story where someone has to die or someone has to give a part of himself or... Or there is some kind of primordial chaos, uh, you know, a kind of a primeval soup from which the gods derive the, the more sensible world. Yes, Baha came to be used almost exclusively for the creation of the divine, the, the creations of the creator of the world. And we're going to focus a bit on this verb, Baha, and the implications of it, because as we've not said, it's, it's a fairly unique word in its usage here. Uh, it has a common Semitic root, like many of the words in the Old Testament, but it comes to have a very special implication here. 
it's not generally used for just any kind of creation. It is reserved, as she said, for the creations of Elohim, of, of God himself. And it's used in a kind of ex nihil capacity to suggest that God is creating things out of nothing, which is a fairly unique and innovative and, and probably controversial idea for the time when yes. it was more common to have gods who were depicted as fashioning the world out of a kind of primordial chaos, as in Greek mythology. Yes. Yes. And and actually, the chaos actually appears, but it appears after God made the substance that the chaos will be made of. If you see, like, uh, God creating the sky and the earth, but the earth was chaos. Uh, you, the, 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 the thing God created was not was not perfect, but he, he he sort of like brought them out of nothing, and and that's very important. That that's not unheard of. And that is a fascinating detail as well. That these things were not created whole and complete and perfect in the yes. beginning. In the beginning, they were in fact part of a process, which, as we're going to point point out, is kind of fascinating from a modern perspective because it it accords pretty well with our modern understanding of the world. Did, the world did not just pop out of nothingness. Uh, it, it wasn't instantaneous. It wasn't overnight. It was very gradual. And I think that it's really remarkable how intuitive the ancient authors of Genesis had to have been to have framed this creation story in the way that they did. So, yes, uh, you know, again, keep in mind this, this Baha verb. You're going to be seeing it pop up again and again. That in the first verse, God creates out of nothing, essentially, the, the heavens and earth. So what happens in the second verse, Leave not? So, so what actually happened is like uh, God creates uh, the earth and the sky, and the earth was chaotic. The the word used here is uh, tohu vabo, um, which is kind of interesting in a way because aside of the fact of it being a cool kind of playful wording, like uh, I'm trying to find equivalent in English to explain it. Well, to they you. rhyme. They they uh, rhyme pretty directly and. Uh, it, yeah, it's they're part right, of the but... musicality of, of uh, ancient Hebrew. If you if you read Genesis in translation, you're going to miss a lot of this. You know, a lot of the a lot of yes. the parallelism will still be relatively evident conceptually, but there's really no replacement <laughs> for the sheer beauty of the wordplay that you can find in Bachishith if you actually read it in the original. Yes. Yes, I think the the closest way I can explain to you guys, it's like if if I said and 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 the earth was mish mesh, yes, kind of deal. But but it's funny because they they didn't just make a word to rhyme and sound good. It's 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 that sounds good and it's interesting. Tovbo actually hides a meaning, and to, before I dive in to explain to you the meaning, I'm going to say right now the Genesis trying to be very careful. And not naming thing, okay? The moon will not be called moon. The sun will not be called sun. Uh, the crocodile, the alligator, the whales, they're not be, they will not be named. And this is important because the, each and every name that was used was actually a god name. And while the first chapter uh, was composed in a way to say that God is above all the other gods, we will still not name those gods uh, because we don't want you to think about them. But we do want to tell you that this god is like the almighty. So, To, uh, Vabo, um, To is very much Tiamat, uh, which is uh, the death. Uh, Tiamat is uh, a, sh a Sumerian and a Babylonian uh, Akkadian goddess. The primordial goddess of uh, water, as I think uh, deep water. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, she's the salt water, right? The the yes. salty water. Uh, she, yeah. she represents the salt water, and Apsu represents the fresh water. Yes, and Apsu is her mate. Is one is actually one of our children, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, it just showed that like uh, uh, that the earth was in chaos. Uh, but at the same time, we kind of refer to the old myth, the Akkadian myth of creation, where Tiamat uh, is going to war against the other gods. Um, so in a very, very interesting way, we, we kind of say the earth was full of water, it was chaotic, but at the same time we kind of say, hey, do you remember that other mythology of creation? 
yeah, we're going to build on that without saying Tiamat. And when when and the next line is about uh, God hovering over the water, and whoever read the original uh, text of the Akkadian creation myth, like Jordan, he pointed out to me and he said this is very intimate, and it kind of reminds the intimate way that Apsu is moving over Tiamat. So I, I don't know if I fully uh, agree with it, but it's definitely there. The difference I can tell that like uh, the, the Akkadian myth is, is, is like all the other mythology is very intimate. While here God is, is a creator, is a being, is above it, is, is some kind of a level up above it. So that's a very interesting uh, way to look at it. Yes, the echo of Babylonian mythology and creation stories is found all throughout Genesis, but it is transmuted, as, as Lidnot points out, whereas Babylonian creation stories tend to be very intimate and very physical in their details. Genesis is obviously more remote. It presents God as this sort of a more distant engineer or architect, as I've stated before. Uh, but I think that there are echoes that can be found in it. Again, in the Mahachefeth, where God is hovering over the waters, or at least his, his uh, ruach, his, his breath is hovering over the water. Uh, breath in other places in the Old Testament is somewhat more uh, intimate. And this is a somewhat intimate image of God. It, it is obviously somewhat uh, physical, at least in, in terms of an image. Um, even if the language seems clearly symbolic here, it still suggests that a part of God is is moving very closely upon the waters and in some way, in, in my mind, imbuing the water with life. It's it's giving form and meaning yes. and, and life to the yes. water. Uh, in Hebrew, there's a few words that mean soul. And ruach is one of them. Usually it refer uh, in the Talmud, actually, uh, there's a spirit, soul, um, breath, um living living idea uh, it's kind of it's kind of emphasized that the man is like the highest creation and there are like levels below it ruach if i'm not mistaken is one of the lowest levels but it's still kind of saying a soul which kind of makes sense because uh, the beings that should not be moving uh, like plants like uh like the earth should get like a minimal idea of soul while the, the higher being, like the, the animals, the men, would get a higher level of soul. Uh, and then and then God speak, and he said, let it be light. And it's very important to emphasize that this light here is not the light of the sun. It's not actually the creation of any uh, moon or sun or star. It's... It's here to emphasize the idea that we're going to make uh, some kind of order in the chaos, like someone walking into a dark room before he, he starts to clean it up, so he set off the light. So this is a very interesting concept of, of idea of light. And another thing, I, God speaks. He doesn't create, he speaks. If you're familiar with, 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 the, with the term abracadabra, it means evra keedabra which mean I will create as I will speak. God create with his words. And it's very beautiful. It's the idea that like God um, is very high. He doesn't use his hands. He doesn't use his methods of exactly. uh, fight and, and, and battling. He, he created it This peacefully. is the beginning of the intellectualization of creation where the God in this case is not depicted as forming the world with his hands. Uh, or in any way physically doing so, so much as simply willing it into creation. He is conceiving of an idea of what the world will be, and he is speaking it into existence, which is, which is a pretty remarkable thing for this time period in the, the first millennium BC. So really, really remarkable stuff. Uh, I, I, I don't think it can be overstated how novel this this sort of thinking was in that time period it was it was radical and completely unlike any really co you know comparable uh, creation story that we know of at okay. the time okay and and then we have uh, something very unique 
uh, God reflect on his work, uh, kind of like uh, an artist who's looking at, over his painting. It's like, damn, I did a good job, kind of deal. Uh, so God say, see the thing and say, like, it's good. Um, and basically, and this is very interesting, aside of the second day, uh, God will reflect on each and every creation as as has been done well, aside of the last part when God created the man and God doesn't say anything about that either. Like he doesn't say it's... And that's a kind of an ominous yeah, note about what's Because it's to not come, good, right? it's not evil, but when he finishes work completely and he look on, on everything, he said it was very good. So, the, so like there's still hope, there's still hope that we're not completely, uh, you know, completely without correction, without... Uh, Potential. We, yeah. We've got some merit. Um, and, and I like that. You know, and, and that's a good way of putting it that um, we, we may not be perfect in and of ourselves in a, a biblical uh, framework but, uh, or from a biblical standpoint, but we, we fit into the whole rather well. It, it, it reminds me a lot of uh, ideas about Melkor and, and the Ida Lindale, uh the creation story from the Silmarillion of, of J.R.R. Tolkien who was obviously influenced by the Genesis narrative as many subsequent creators were. Uh, so yes, uh, we're, we're up to uh, verse four at this point where God looks upon the light. He sees the light that it is, is good. Uh, in Hebrew, it's a uh, Elohim um, So God divides between the light and the dark. We have the beginnings of, the the order that we now see in the world and, and yes and time where uh we we have the earth operating almost as a clock would uh we have essentially a kind of a divine clockwork here yes. and a divine clock maker uh again somewhat unlike most of the preceding creation stories that we know of uh, emanating it, from this I, i'm area. always amazed by it because the sensitivity of Whoever like wrote this down, did the idea that time itself had to be created as well. That like on on the time that there was like chaotic substance, there was no need for time. Or the time that we proceed now is not. It, it was not the way it is, and it kind of fits very well with a lot of big band theory when you think about it. So that's that's very interesting. The the, the idea of of time and space and and stuff that were created. Uh, when we have more or less the idea of what we are creating now, it's it's very beautiful and it's very unique, because I don't think I've seen another mythology regarding with such respect to time like this one, and because um, the light appearing and then the dark uh, actually in uh, Judaism. Uh, a day starts from from the sunset until sunset, so that's a very important uh, concept. Right. Uh, well, and let's face it: not only is this conceptualization of time very beautiful, but I can't think of very many creation stories before or since that handle their general subject matter with such elegance and and, and dignity. You know, you have the beginnings here of what I think are very characteristically Jewish aesthetics of symmetry and parallelism where God does not simply create light in a vacuum. He creates it in opposition to darkness. These two things coexist. They, they are shown to be unable to exist without one another and to be sort of mutually opposing pairs, as we will see very frequently, not only throughout this beginning Genesis narrative, but throughout the, the Tanakh, but throughout the Hebrew Old Testament. And this parallelism is again a very distinguishing feature of Jewish thought. It's it's one that is most remarkable to me as an outsider. And live not, I was wondering if you would take a minute and tell our audience about what it means to you as you know a, a believer, uh, one who practices you know Judaism uh, regarding the the switch of time and the day. Uh, regarding uh, the the concept of parallelism and symmetry uh, in in well, thought. I think it's important because then we have the concept that like uh, one thing cannot exist without the other. There's no absolute evil. There's no absolute good. There's no absolute light. There's not absolute darkness. 
that one cannot exist without the other and there's a constant uh, balance that gotta be preserved at all times and you know that's in Judaism the idea that you are alive the idea that you are created is the idea that you are going to struggle and we will soon see it come into pass when we reach the story of Adam and Eve eventually when they need to when they're like force between the test of good and evil but it's one of the things with like at the end of the day you cannot escape the the struggle you cannot escape the balance and, and it's there and it's in a way it's very beautiful because there's no such thing as absolute very much so so uh, going forward here uh, in verse five we have the beginning of the, the you know sort of a uh, onomastics of right we have the naming of these concepts so god uh, calls the light day and he calls the darkness mm -hmm. night uh, and you have the evening and the morning of the first day and again as we've not pointed out it's the evening that is actually listed first here that's that's how the reckoning of time occurs in jewish thought yeah which is kind of fascinating uh somewhat distinctive from from a lot of uh, western ideas about th the way we calculate time so in verse six uh uh just just before just before this is very important i i know most of you probably won't be able to understand the importance of that god called the first day day one and this is very important he used the the the, the term yom echad because it's it's a very gentle and very scary uh, uh it's it's the start and nobody knows if it's going to continue or not so instead of saying first day you just say day one because we don't know exactly what's going on, if it's going to continue, and it, it's very beautiful. It's very sensitive. It's kind of keeping the readers on, uh, tense. So just so you know, if you ever going to read the Bible in the native language, you you're definitely going to sense the the idea behind here. So yes, it's very intentionally giving it a number as opposed to again you know simply calling it the first day as they could have done as they did with the first word of of you know the the book so we go forward and god continues to create in this kind of a distinctive way he says let there be uh, essentially the uh hakia, the uh, the firmament or the expanse it's from a, a root meaning yes. to beat or stamp out and and uh, in this context yes. to spread out it's something that is spread out mm -hmm. uh over the waters uh, and dividing between uh, yes. dividing water from water, essentially giving character to various seas yes. and oceans, and, presumably. Uh, uh, the, the verb of Raki al Koa uh, is used <coughs> in modern Hebrew, and I'm pretty sure like it has uh, an ancient meaning, which it's like when someone takes uh, a metal and he wants to bend it to create something out of the mantle like uh, when he smelt it and and yes. you need to after it's completely burned and, and 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 ready to be made so that's that's another way where where we feel like god making also rakia in modern uh hebrew means sky and god uh, actually does something very interesting he separate the sky from the water so like everything was in a mix life started in water so and, and this is a very beautiful uh again intuition idea that like the ancient felt that life started in the water uh which again we have uh we have proof of it to to be so right yes i mean it's this is something that we found fascinating about the genesis narrative the the central position of water in the story of the beginnings of life because, of course, from a modern perspective, we know that life began uh, in the water and through a very, very vast and in many ways beautiful evolutionary process came to diverge and multiply into the various life forms that we know now that have now occupied the, the air and the earth. But it all began in the water. And so the fact that Life in Genesis begins, essentially, the creation begins with the breath of God hovering upon the water is very beautiful. And, and we think uh, somewhat eerily intuitive of uh, the ancient Israelites to have conceived of this. Again, it's not without precedent. Tiamat and Apsu were also water creators. But again, the, the, the Genesis narrative, while being similar in many respects, is, is very, very different in others and how it presents the creation. 
So uh, again, going forward in, in line seven, we have, or in verse seven, we have God making the... Yes. Uh, the, basically, what happened here is uh, uh, God uh, separated the sky from uh, from the, the underwater, the what what's going to be the ocean or the rivers or whatever. It's, it's the idea that like the whole... If you think about it, again, from the galaxy perspective, it's kind of like a, a planet of water that's slowly becoming, I guess, with atmosphere and, and thing. It's, it's very mystical. Uh, and please notice that God is not able to finish the work on the second day. He, he has in a very big struggle with the water. Actually, the, 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 the task carry on to the next day uh, because he's only able to create the sky. And and the, the the water beneath is very is very uh, unmade. It's it's not completely finished. Um, which again br- bring us to the whole uh, Tiamat story. With how monumental the water was conceived as being yeah. in, in ancient thought. Um, you know you have to remember that from an ancient perspective, water more so even than the sky represents sort of the the unknown. You know the boundaries of the earth. And uh, another point that I want to make here is that. In verse 7, we have a continuation of or this idea of the sub-creation, where God has created things, uh, ex nihilo, out of nothing, and now he is giving character to those things once they have been created. He, is, he has created the waters out of nothingness, but now he is giving them an expanse, giving them a firmament, and giving them a, a personality, as it were, once they have been created. Uh, again, this is... This is something that we see in, in Tolkien. This idea of uh, physical creation as opposed to yes. sort of divine creation. Yes. And, and and I think we also spoke about the fact that uh, um, in it's kind of different uh, because in other mythology, like the, the earth starts first and not the water. The, the, the earth is, is a being that was created first and then the water came from it or her because usually the earth is a female um, while here like there's the idea that like uh, everything started in the atmosphere in in the water in 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 the fogs in you know everything that has to do uh, with the water concept and this is important to note, as you say, because, uh, for example, in Greek mythology, we have chaos coming first and Earth simply appearing out of it, at least in the theogony of Hesiod. Uh, we are given no real explanation for this. It simply happens, which is fine. That often happens in, you know, mythological stories. But we have Earth emerging from this sort of uh, primordial chaos and Erebos and Black Knight being born from chaos, suggesting that these things were not part of some kind of a divine plan. There was no design or intention behind these things. They simply happen, which again is, you know, it, it's fine. It's interesting. And in some ways that accords more with our understanding of the beginnings of the world with, you know, conceptions of the Big Bang, as, as Livnot has pointed out. Uh, but again, it's, it's utterly distinct from the Genesis narrative because we don't have the intention and we have Earth as the sort of focal point being one of the first things to emerge from chaos as opposed to water which comes later in the greek cosmogony and you know this this idea of of the water as being the uh, gestational force or, or fountain from which life springs uh you know instead of having the yes. earth um in, in the greek and conception. then we we are coming to the end of the second day which is is called uh, second um nothing nothing strange here like from here on out we know that we're going to continue the creation god does not speak that it was good because he didn't finish the task so even in judaism perspective monday is always considered a very <laughs> very bad day a very uh, draining day i i think even in modern day we can feel it in a way <laughs> yes i can tell you that Livnot hates monday uh, there's no <laughs> doubt about this. It is a very strong sentiment okay. that she has. And then we come to line nine, where God say, where God kind of says, uh, "Let the water be deepened into the earth, so the so the earth will be seen." And so it was. 
the earth surfacing from the water and now when we have the earth uh, the water are actually able to find their location so the water is able to kind of be uh, cut down and move into parts and and once again we are recalling of how Tiamat's body was cut down and spread around the world so there will be rivers and and seas and um, a lot of water bodies and, and again it, gently we kind of touch you know foreign mythology yes. that everyone familiar with but at the same time saying ah, ah, ah this is something new this is the fate so it's beautiful um, in a way and and again you know we we have this lack of the, the kind of the physicality and and the bloodshed and you know, these more brutal elements from the the Babylonian creation story. And again, as Lynn points out, there are reasons for this. We have to imagine that, uh, of course, they didn't want to name these figures, but we we do have the uh, the home from line two, the the sort of primordial deep, which is cognate with with Tiamat. Um, and somewhat obviously so, any any native speaker at the time would have been able to make that connection, uh, almost certainly. And we, as modern readers, can also draw that parallel. Uh, but they couldn't actually name the figures because they were moving towards this more monotheistic, or at least monolatristic, uh, belief system where they recognized only one god as being supreme above all others. Whereas they might have recognized the existence of other gods, they didn't want to give them the, the honor of yes. naming them or, or certainly and giving the them Hebrew a part in the creation. For the word the Yabasha is very fascinating. It actually means uh, to be dry. Uh, so the substance, which is not water, is actually something that is just uh, without water. So it's, it's kind of funny. Everything is related to water. Water is the best. Another kind of a neat uh, detail here in my mind is is the with the ra'eh, this this sort of a more passive uh, meaning of the the uh, ra'a verb, um, which normally means to see, but here means to appear. You know, in, in other words, it's literally the the dry land w was seen. It it came to to you know, be visible yes. and to appear um, by the will of God, yeah, which kind of makes every power in this story to be. Uh, powerless in a sense because God willing it nobody here is active there's no other gods there's no other creation and then we have the grass and then we have the trees uh, and you know the, the 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 earth is sprouting and you have the beginnings of, of seeds and again this kind of attention to this idea of an engineer who is creating things now according to their kind everything has an order everything has some kind of a purpose that it's fulfilling and each thing accords with things of its own kind uh, so that we have an explanation for species yes. essentially um, e even among yes. plants uh, very attention to detail and because God was able to finish the, the task of preparing uh, the ground so to speak <laughs> for his other creation uh, God says it was good God, God can finally said that the task was done so because uh, god finished two tasks at one day uh, judaism uh, sees uh, tuesday as a very good day uh, it's called twice good uh because this is uh, the day where god made two big accomplishment and the day he's done and speaking of times especially of good times we're going to take a bit of a break here we're going to conclude this episode Hope that you've enjoyed. Hope that you found it interesting. Uh, but we're going to be back, of course. We're going to continue to dissect uh, Genesis in hopefully not too excruciating detail for you. But we're fascinated by this kind of stuff. We're, we're, we're language nerds. We want to get into it. We want to get into the etymology of it, the how, the why. What did these things mean at their roots? Uh, we want to try to approach what the ancients may have thought when they were composing these texts. Because it's a, it's a really remarkable achievement in the history of mankind, in, in literary history, in theological history, in some ways, I think that it has some interest for scientific and philosophical thinkers. So we're going to conclude it for today. Um, hope that you will join us the next time for part two of our breakdown of Genesis here on On the Waters. On the Waters. That's right. Uh, 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 uh. So, you know, saying goodbye to you from Walker, Louisiana. I'm Jordan. And goodbye from Israel. I'm Livnat. 
It's been a pleasure. We'll see you soon. Catch ya. Thank you.